So far, the past couple of weeks, we've considered uh, the church at Ephesus, and it was a careless church, having forgotten its first love. The lesson that we learned is that we want to make sure that we are always more concerned about who we are in our hearts than just being concerned about what we do. And then we looked at the church at Smyrna. It was a crushed church, a persecuted church, and a crowned church. They faced pressure and poverty and put-downs, but they faithfully endured, and so they received commendation from the Lord. And the Lord tells them that, yes, persecution will come in all of our lives, but to continue to live faithfully, and God would reward them greatly. Now today we look at the church at Pergamum. It is a compromising church. As John writes to these seven churches, I've told you this before, he writes in a geographical order that the regional mail carrier would have taken and going from town to town. After leaving Smyrna, a letter carrier would travel along the coast of the Aegean Sea for about 40 miles. And then the road would turn northeast along the Caicos River. About 10 miles inland stood the impressive city of Pergamum, a citadel city built on a hill 1,000 feet above the surrounding countryside creating a natural fortress to protect the city. Now from the city you could see the Mediterranean Sea out about 10 miles. The Roman historian Pliny called it by far the most famous city in Asia. It is the present city of Bergama in Turkey today. The city of Pergamum didn't have the beauty of Smyrna nor the commerce of Ephesus. However, it was still a great city in its own right, a city of culture and government. Rivaling Ephesus as the leading city in the region, Pergamum had become the capital of the province of Asia. The city was wealthy, it was cultured, it was educated. Three things characterized the city. It was renowned for its intellectual achievement, its political power, and its pagan worship. Intellectually, they were well known for their library. It was the second largest library in the world at that time, second only to the library in Alexandria in Egypt. It was a 200,000 volume library. Now in today's estimates, 200,000 volumes wouldn't seem like that large of a library. But when you consider that every page of every book was handwritten on papyrus and on parchment, it was quite an achievement. And I'll tell you what, the books didn't look like this book. They were scrolls, my friends. Along the same lines, Pergamum was the place where parchment was invented. Parchment was a type of writing material developed from animal skins and was far stronger than papyrus, which was made from reeds. The story goes that 300 years before Christ, the ruler of Pergamum, seeking to expand the great library in his city, wooed Aristophanes of Byzantium, who was the librarian in that larger library in Alexandria, to come to work for him here in Pergamum. However, Ptolemy, who was the ruler of Egypt, became irritated when he thought that he could lose this outstanding scholar. So he did everything he could to prevent Aristophanes from leaving Alexandria for Pergamum. It was a bidding war, kind of like we see in pro sports today. For a star player, just happened that this bidding war was for a librarian. So to prevent him from leaving, Ptolemy placed Aristophanes in chains, and then he imposed an embargo on the shipment of papyrus to Pergamum. Papyrus was the primary medium for writing in that day. And in response, the great minds of Pergamum got together and developed a new technique to smooth and polish out tanned animal skins to develop what came to be known as the Pergamum material, or in the Latin, parchment, which, of course, finally replaced papyrus completely. So Pergamum was known for its library. And Pergamum was also known for its political power. The first temple of the imperial cult was built in Pergamum in honor of Rome and of Augustus. 
The city thus became a religious center in the province. Ephesus became the province's main commercial center. Smyrna, the main military center. Pergamum became very wealthy as the center of emperor worship with many temples devoted to idolatry. At, as the seat of the government in Asia, it was here that Caesar worship would have been at its strongest. And you'll remember that the Romans didn't care what god or gods you worshipped as long as you were willing to worship Caesar. Now, there were three temples in Pergamum devoted to emperor worship. Once each year, every citizen was required to walk into any one of these three, your choice. Place a pinch of incense in the fire that was erected around the altar, and all you had to say was, Caesar is Lord. Now think about it. Believers were required to take this title that they believed belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ and ascribe it to Caesar. And if they didn't, they could be executed. Now, because the city of Pergamum was the capital of Asia Minor, it was the administrative home of the Roman governor. Roman governors were divided into two categories back then, those who had the right of the sword and those who didn't. Those who had the right of the sword literally had the power of life and death. On their word, a person could be executed on the spot by the sword. The governor, who had his office in Pergamum, had the right of the sword, and at any moment, he could use it on any of the citizens in Pergamum. Each of the seven letters begins with a portrait of Christ, remember? Did you pick up the portrait of Christ in the letter to Pergamum? It says this, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. It appeared as if the Roman governor had the power of life and death with the right of the sword, but what Christ wanted to convey to those in Pergamum is that his sword was double-edged and much more powerful than the Roman governor's sword. See, Christ is reminding these believers in Pergamum that the last word is still with him. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Christ has the sharp, two-edged sword. Rome might be powerful, but Christ is more powerful. Christ ultimately is the one who holds the power of life and death because of what he did for us in his death on the cross and subsequent glorious resurrection, not Caesar. And third, Pergamum was noted for its pagan worship. The city was filled with pagan temples, so much so that the very presence of Satan seemed to have settled upon the city. Pergamum was practically overrun with pagan temples to like Zeus, Athena, and Dionysus. There was also a temple in Pergamum to Asclepius, the god of healing and medicine. His temple was filled with snakes. And when a person needed healing, they would go into that temple, they would lie down on the floor, and spend the night in a room with a group of snakes. Now, if a snake, I think some of the ladies are going to a place where there's some snakes. Yeah. You can try this while you're there. If a snake crawled across your body during your stay, they considered themselves healed. So these temples were the nearest thing they had to hospitals in the ancient world, and people from all over the Roman Empire flocked to Pergamum for the relief of their affliction. Some have suggested that because of the practice that Asclepius was called Asclepius the Savior. Now think about that one. Christians in Pergamum would have viewed this as so blasphemous. And that is why Christ says in the letter that Pergamum is where the throne of Satan resided because you got to choose. Is a human being like, or a god like a Syphilis going to be your god? Or is Christ going to be your god? And here's a side note. The symbol of the god in the Asclepius temple was a snake intertwined around a staff. That image can still be seen today as the emblem of the medical profession. So look at verse 13. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. So Jesus told the church at Ephesus that he knew their works, 
He told the church at Smyrna he knew their worries. He tells the people of Pergamum he knows their whereabouts. He knows that they live in Satan town. Christ recognizes the fact that Pergamum is not an easy place for a Christian to live and still remain unstained by the immorality and the idolatry of that surrounding environment. Jesus knows they are living in a tough place. And I'll tell you what, you ought to consider this as well. Jesus knows where you live as well. Jesus knows your situation too. He knows when you're in a difficult marriage. He knows when you face persecution, maybe at a job or where people mock you. He knows when you're in an abusive relationship. Jesus knows. Jesus knows the good times. Jesus knows the difficult times. And we are told that they live, the Greek word live, in Pergamum. Now, there are two words translated live or dwell in the New Testament. One means to take up a temporary dwelling. The other one means to settle down, to stay for long term, to take up a permanent residence. These Christians had settled down in Pergamum. And so the word used is the one for permanent residence. They were not running away from the trouble around them, and Christ commends them for this. You know, far too often we allow the world to cause us to run and hide in fear when it comes to what we believe. People tell us they don't want to hear what we have to say. Political correctness is running wild in our society, and it is Satan's greatest tool to get Christians to compromise their values or at least to stop talking about them. In other words, we Christians must make our stand in this world and be willing to stand up and speak up against the evils and the wickedness of our society, whatever the cost. It may be easier to live somewhere else in easier circumstances, but our duty is to stay and become a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, to overcome the world in which we live. Jesus expects us to live as his disciples in a world that does not always know God, nor do they value what God values. As Christians, we must speak up and impact the culture, even when the culture says, you can't say that, you're offending me. I like what George McLeod said, and I quote him here. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace, as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on the town garbage heap at that, at a crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Latin and Greek, at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble, because that's where Christ died, and that's what he died about. That is where Christians ought to be and what Christians should be about, unquote. See, Jesus said to the church at Pergamum, I know where you live, and you remain true to my name. Yes! What a commendation. Continuing on in verse 13, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. See, of all the seven cities, Pergamum was the one in which the church was most likely to clash with the Roman emperor, imperial worship. This made for many martyrs who were willing who were not willing to blaspheme Jesus Christ by saying Caesar is Lord. The pagan residents of the city, they were willing to accommodate other gods. They were not willing, however, to tolerate an exclusive religion where a Christian would come up and say, my Savior is Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father but through me. And on our day, people don't care what you believe, right? As long as you don't make a big deal about it, don't bother me. It's relativism. Relativism is the religion of the day. And Christians are chastised for mentioning the name of Jesus Christ. Christians then become afraid to speak up for their beliefs because of what other people might think. In spite of opposition, the church at Pergamum was committed to Jesus Christ. They did not deny their faith. And G Jesus or Jesus singles out a particular martyr, Antipas, who opposed the idolatry of the empire and, because of his faithfulness, was put to death. 
Satan will try anything, you see, to destroy the church. Like Smyrna, the church of Pergamum was faithful in the, to the name of Jesus Christ. But remember this. If Satan is unable to destroy the church by persecution, then he will try to destroy the church through compromise. Compromise was at the core of the teaching of those who followed Balaam. In the Old Testament, Balaam tried to overcome the faithfulness of the Israelite people by enticing the men of Israel to marry women from Moab. Balaam hoped that these women would introduce their Jewish husbands to other gods so that those husbands would forsake the one true God of Israel. He felt that he could cause Jews to become less Jewish if they would simply compromise what they believed about their God. Today, if Satan can get Christians to lower their standards and to begin to accept the practices of the world, and not only accept them, but allow them to creep into the church, then Satan has accomplished what he has set out to do. He has gotten the church to relax her standards, and before long, Satan understands that the church will start to look like the world. You won't be able to tell a believer from an unbeliever. In Pergamum, Christians were compromising their faith in Jesus. How so? By eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality in some of those pagan temples. When we embrace evil or sin in our world today, it wrecks havoc with our relationship with Jesus Christ. So what is our weapon to combat compromise? To know what God values. To know the Bible. To know the Word of God. We must know what the Word of God teaches. Jesus comes to the church at Pergamum with this two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 tells us, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. See, God knows the heart. And with his sword, he knows those who believe and trust in him, and he knows those who are unbelievers and have turned their backs on him. And so, for the believers, if we know what God wants us to do, and how do we know that? By knowing the word of God, then we ought to do it. Jesus told the church, I know where you live, right in the middle of Satan town. He says, you have remained true to my name. You have not renounced your faith. Pergamum had no problem accommodating Christianity. One more God in town was not a problem. It was easy to appease the state religion. A bust of the emperor was set atop an altar with a fire burning below. And to make a sacrifice to the spirit of Rome, all one had to do was take a few grains of incense, toss it into the fire, and say, Caesar is Lord. It was so simple, so easy. But to call the faith in Christ is a call to be set apart. Not to go along with the crowd. We're not supposed to worship the government. We're not supposed to worship any human being who has power in government. We are to worship God. Paul cautions us in Romans 12. We read it at the beginning of the worship service this morning. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The idea is stop letting the world squeeze you into its mold. Far too often we let our desires to be accepted, and to fit in, to shape who we are and how we're going to live. We are not even thinking anymore. We're just going along with the crowd. We go along to get along, and we're told to hate anyone who disagrees with the crowd. But we need to stop that. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Use your mind. God gave it to you as a gift. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. Do you want to live like God wants you to? Then change the way you think. Begin thinking for yourself, led by the word of God. The church of Pergamum was being influenced by worldly ideas. What this church needed to do was to make a total change. The same counsel applies not only to this first century church, but to the church in 2019. So Jesus tells the church in verse 16, repent and trust Christ. 
Your faith in Christ will make you victorious. You will become overcomers of sin and death. You will be blessed. And he says you'll be blessed in three ways. Through hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name. Now, i got to tell you, don't take that literally. <laughs> These are symbols. Quite simply, the hidden manna is a symbolic picture of Jesus Christ, who did tell us in the Gospels he was the bread of heaven. Remember the manna of the Exodus. It sustained and it strengthened the Israelites for the 40 years of desert wanderings. And in the same way, today, Jesus strengthens and sustains us spiritually as we walk through this life on our way to heaven. Jesus is the manna from heaven, the spiritual sustenance that we need each and every day. Here, Jesus made the connection between the manna of Moses' day and his own provision of salvation through the cross of Calvary for the people in the first century and now in the 21st century. Jesus said, these are his words, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven. Here, Jesus, I'm the bread that came down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world on the cross. The manna that sustained the Israelites was a foreshadowing a predicting of the sacrifice of Christ, the true manna from heaven, mentioned here in Revelation 2.17. We receive the benefits of salvation by placing our faith in the bread of heaven in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now it says that this manna has an adjective, is hidden manna, in that it is given exclusively to believers in Christ. Only believers will reap the benefits of salvation because they are the only ones who will understand who Christ is. The unbelieving world that rejects Christ will never know the joy and satisfaction that faith in him will bring unless we speak up and we start telling people who do not know about God and about Christ what we do know coming from the Word of God. The recipient of this head and manna is specified it is the one who is victorious. It's the overcomer. The overcomer is the one who endures in his faith despite trials and hardships and temptations to conform and compromise one's faith. See, in the Bible, there's only one reference of God giving us a white stone with a new name written on it. And it's right here in Revelation 2.17. To the one who is, a vic who is victorious, who is an overcomer, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Now the best theory, and believe you me, because this is a one-timer in the Bible, there are many, many theories about what this white stone is. So I had to choose one for you this morning. And I will choose this one. I believe that it goes along with an ancient Roman custom of awarding white stones, in fact, the word here is pebble, a, a white pebble, to the victors of ag athletic contests. Because see, after a day of all this competing, they held an awards banquet at the end of the day. So the winner of each one of the athletic contests was awarded a white stone with his name inscribed on it. This was his ticket to a special awards banquet. Now, I don't know if you see the symbolism like I see the symbolism, but according to this view, Jesus promises those who are faithful Christians, the overcomers, entrance into the eternal victory celebration around that great banqueting table promised us in heaven. And what about the new name? Most likely, it refers to the Holy Spirit's work of conforming believers to the holiness of Jesus Christ. And when we receive Christ in our hearts, we take on a new name. Christians are followers of Jesus Christ. So what does God want for us here at Desert Palms? The same thing he wanted for the church at Pergamum. Christ wants our church to be a bright 
beacon of light in a world that is filled with so much of the darkness of Satan. He wants us to be a Christian in a pagan society. We may be surrounded by those who do not know God and want to live in a world of relativism, but Christ would have us stand firm and not let such false doctrines into our hearts. God knows our hearts. He wants, does not want us to be tossed to and fro by every false doctrine that comes along. And if we will remain faithful, God will reward us with a reward that is out of this world. But here's the question of the day. Will you answer God's call to live faithfully without compromising your Christian values? Amen and amen.